This is Gat in the Mecca, the weekly anime and manga show where we take things one step further. I analyse everything from arcs to OPs to episodes in my wacky but enjoyable quest to make sense of all of it. Welcome back to Get in the Mecca, I'm your host Jamal today and in today's episode I bring you a bit of a different episode today. This time I didn't really intend to write about this or think about this until I watched a few films and I really got inspired and that is a look at aspect ratios in anime filmmaking. This, uh, as I've kind of already established, is a pretty niche-ish episode, but I want to talk about why these are so important, because I think these are, it's a component of film which we get quite a lot of within anime, but it's something which is quite overlooked, and I think we take it for granted mostly for a few reasons, because some aspect ratios are used a lot more than others, and we're so used to others in relation to normal films or real-life films. And so I want to discuss, one, what an aspect ratio is, how that relates to space within filmmaking. And then I do want to talk a bit about some practical uses for aspect ratios and how aspect ratios can be used really well and with intentionality. Some of my favorite scenes in anime come from an almost spectacular use of an aspect ratio. So that is really it. Let's get into today's episode. This is episode 48 of Guests of the Mecca, an analysis of aspect ratios in anime filmmaking. So before we dive into the analysis, I should say that most of this episode will be almost non-contextualized analysis. Most of it will be around aspect ratios and I will use a few examples, but most of them won't be in the context of the anime. I won't be giving away plot details or things like that. When I do go a bit more in detail in regards to very specific uses, then I will eventually have to name some plot details. One of them probably being for Kizumonogatari, which I love as a film, so there may be spoilers for that. But as I said before, most of this episode will be just blatant examples of aspect ratios and films of which they are used in anime and how they are used. And that will not involve me spoiling an entire anime for you. The best place to start in regards to this analysis today is obviously what is an aspect ratio. The two things I want to answer today, at least to begin this episode, are what is an aspect ratio and what is space in regards to film. So obviously a ratio is the difference between width and height so that is put into a literal ratio or mathematical ratio. For example, though we wouldn't use this in film, 2 to 1, 1 to 3, 5 to 7, those are ratios. However, in the context of film, we are talking about what the image is in. And when I say in, that doesn't refer to the actual height and width of the image itself, but the frame of which it's in, if that makes sense. Although I know that is slightly non-technical or missing out on a few things. Some techies would say that that is wrong because when we think of stuff like sensor sizes, you wouldn't say an aspect ratio is full frame, which we would talk about is 16 to 9, for example. But the main thing to distinguish if we are just talking about it in a bit more of a casual context is what framing the image is in in relation to the screen itself and it should be distinguished from the resolution. If we were talking about resolution then we would mostly be discussing 1920, 1080. The most common aspect ratio which we come across not only in anime but in TV in general today is 16 to 9. 16 to 9 is almost the, I want to say the final aspect ratio for now anyway, with the size of screens and computers and laptop screens of which we have today, mostly everything is in 16 to 9. The majority of TV anime you watch is in 16 to 9. And 16 to 9 is also what we see a lot in regular TV. Most of your soap operas, most of your, your news channels, everything, or almost everything is within this ratio. It is seen at the moment as the almost golden ratio for television and displaying things. We also have the 4 to 3 aspect ratio. This is something you'll see if you are watching shows which come from the pre-2000s. Not every anime from the pre-2000s is in 4 to 3, but a lot of them are. 
Neon Genesis Evangelion, Serial Experiments Lane. I could go on for ages, but most of these are in 4 to 3. These are these black bars which come on the edges of your screen. But we have to remember that this wasn't the case for the people watching this on TV because most of the TVs were made in this fashion. And so this filled up the entirety of that old CRT TV, for example. Whereas now we have we have the black bars to look at. The interesting thing about 4 to 3 now is that although yes, we relate it to the old stuff, which is kind of where this explanation is going. That also means that when it is used, there was a recent episode of Kaguya Sama Love is Wolf from when this is being recorded, which used that aspect ratio for a short scene, but it was actually quite good. And you can tell that that is being used for an intended effect instead of it being the standard of the time, because it isn't the standard of our time today. Just to end our sort of mini discussion on 4 to 3, because I won't really be speaking about that ratio, because it's not completely relevant to today's anime landscape. But its existence then wasn't necessarily with the intention of creating this immersive cinematic experience. It was because it was optimal, because it worked for, again, the size of TVs and the size of production and everything else. It worked for that time. And you can argue that 16 to 9 works for this time, but the aspect ratios which we will go on to, which will mostly be this comparison between 16 to 9 and what you can call 21 to 9, but I will be referring to mostly as 2.35 to 1, has an almost different effect, and its existence is quite different to the existence of 4 to 3. So if we return to 16 to 9, one of the big focuses of today's episode, I would say that 16 to 9 as a ratio is probably the almost final stage for anime, or it seems like it has won the battle for the ultimate aspect ratio. It is what most anime is in. It's dominated the past 20 years of anime as being the place to go, and that applies again to TV. I guess the main question which comes out of this is, if 16 to 9 is the one which everyone uses, and it appears as if there is more space for the image, there's more information on the screen because it's the, f because it's the full size of your laptop screen, for example, or the full size of the screen when you go to the cinema, you probably wonder why isn't this better? More space is better, right? That's probably the question. But this is where 21 to 9 or 2.35 to 1 comes in. I'm mostly going to be referring to it for the sake of ease, 235 to 1. I know there is a decimal point between 2 and 3. It's just easier and quicker to say for the sake of my examples, and I don't want to, and I don't want to bore you guys by constantly saying 2.35 to 1. So I'm going to keep it 235 to 1 for the sake of these examples. The 235 to 1 aspect ratio is often seen and claimed to be the cinematic aspect ratio. I do believe that it was also referred to as cinemascope in the early days of which it was used for all sorts of films from back in the day. And what this effectively is, because I know this is an audio podcast and it is a bit hard to imagine, but this is the letterbox. This is this, although not literally crops the image, but it appears like it's a crop on the image, making it appear almost like a strip. And there are loads of examples for this being used. We get this in the Kizu trilogy for the Monogatari series. We get it in the Berserk trilogy for the Golden Age arc. Masuki Yusu's Mind Game is also in 235 to 1. A recent film being Children of the Sea, which was also shot in this aspect ratio. There are endless examples, but I do not believe that there are infinitely as many anime on 235 to 1 as there are on 16 to 9 based on its popularity and again how much easier it is you can argue to do and execute. That brings me to a good place to say that there are lots of anime which simply aren't on this ratio. As I just said there are loads and I'm sure I'm almost positive that there are more on this ratio than there are on the quote unquote cinematic aspect ratio. Some very popular films aren't on this, and I think I have a good explanation for this. Shinkai being probably one of the most popular filmmakers of the last decade, a name which has almost become a household name in relation to anime. Most of his films are not in this ratio, including some of his biggest works, with including a lot of his biggest works which were in the cinema themselves. For example, Weathering With You, which was last year when I am recording this, Kimi no Nawa, probably one of his biggest films to date. And then we have a bunch of other films as well from A Silent Voice as well, from Kyoto Animation, other films from them as well, like Liz Tori. And then a lot of our films which are quite 
you can say, quite related to TV series, such as the My Hero Academia films, the Naruto films, I don't believe are on that sort of ratio. There are a lot of examples, basically, to say that 16 to 9 dominates anime. In the case of Makoto Shinkai, though, I would say that the purpose of that is often to bring out space. Space is very important for Shinkai as he attempts to emulate the real. And that's something which I'll leave there and I'll probably touch on when it comes to 16 to 9 later. What exactly is the purpose of 21 to 9 then? I did say that 16 to 9 feels like this golden ratio. It seems like the one that's won and hence why are people still making films or anime films in this ratio? What is the exact point and purpose of this? And for that, it's very good that we understand space in anime and the space in filmmaking as a concept. And the limitation of space will factor into my explanation and analysis as to why this is the case. Case. In my notes, I managed to boil this down. Why well, I thought that this boiled down to three reasons, almost three definitions as to what space is. Space can one concern the setting of the narrative and where it is, which will determine how much space and visual information there is on screen. In the case of a live action film, this will be based on where this film is that genuinely shot. If we take a Mission Impossible film shot in the mountains, or we take a scene from it which is within the sewers, or that scene from or almost, almost any teenage film which has sewers in a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the sewers, that has a very different effect in regards to space because we can control the amount of space and visual information we're given based on where things are shot, and this applies to anime as well. If I use Makoto Shinkai for a good example, a lot of the establishing shots in Kimi no Nawa and the rest of his films take place in these big cities because the intention for that is to display the real and the hustle and bustle of real life. Whereas if we take a scene from Yozakura Quartet, we have these very tight shots where one of our characters is being punched through buildings and the aspect ratio works with that to keep it very tight and almost enclosed. This also relates to how something is framed, and this kind of relates to the first point, but again, how your shot is composed and where exactly you're placing your camera. In the case of anime, we have this imaginary camera, but that can be, because we have these lacking physical limitations when it comes to creating anime, it really is intentional where this quote-unquote camera or imaginary camera is placed to create some sense of space or restricting that sort of space. A great example of this almost intentional framing for restricting space would be the shots in the conclusion to the Monogatari series. I won't go into the details, but towards the conclusion of Wari Monogatari second season, we have a lot of these shots behind the door, and we can see almost half of the door take up most of the frame, and the intention for that and the meaning behind that is to almost make this conversation feel a lot more intense than it is. It feels a lot more voyeuristic, as if we're looking into something that we shouldn't be seeing. This is something which should be impossible when you consider that Monogatari is this anime based on apparitions and the impossible becoming possible within people. This is again very different to a shot like a master shot in the case of Black Rock Shooter or... The, even the beginning of an anime which I've been watching recently, Concrete Revolutio, these master shots are, they, they feel almost like CCTV shots, they do feel voyeuristic as if we're looking into them, but it creates a very vast sense of space because it's almost placed in the corner of that building, although it doesn't exist, and we get this almost panoramic sense of everything which is in the room. And that results in us trying to gain one a bearing of this world or this microcosm of the bigger world. But it also causes our attention to try and focus on something in particular. In this case, it's looking for Jiro in the corner of the room in the case of Concrete Revolution's opening scenes. And then finally, this is one which is highly relevant to this episode, and that is the aspect ratio which is used. This will limit or at least changes the way of which we perceive a said piece of animation. Because something is in 2, 3, 5 to 1, we see it differently because there is versus 16 to 9 just genuinely less space on screen. I'm sure this is worked around in regards to animation when one is drawing on cells, whether that's digital or on paper. The aspect ratio is most likely established from what I understand. 
And so these keyframes are drawn so they can fit into that. But again, it's good to consider that that has been there for a reason. That is placed there for a reason. Everything which is animated is done for that very purpose and fit and all the backgrounds and everything are made for that very framing almost or made for that very aspect ratio. The aspect ratio was something which must be decided very early on if it comes to storyboarding and deciding for shot compositions because the aspect ratio will evidently affect everything which is within it and everything which is made and produced for this anime or for this project. But again, I don't want to get too off track. I do want to keep it in context to aspect ratios and their importance as a opposed to going down the entire pipeline of production and why production is so valuable and intentional. This leads me now to a very good spot and that is readdressing the question what is space and why is space so important? Space if anything is information on screen. Information is very important. It's the foundation of audio visual media. Everything is information from audio to music to voice acting all the way down to how things are animated on the most basic level, backgrounds, the aspect ratio. All of this is information in some way or another. And so aspect ratios are really important when you factor those into space because those restrict or grant us visual information to take in. And hence, to just go a bit further, that can therefore go on to restrict or expand our knowledge of a world. And that can be done in both ways. Restriction shouldn't be seen as a negative thing in this context. We shouldn't view restricting the information as a limitation to the viewer. If anything, limiting information can be seen as a very positive thing in film. And just to summarize that, it means that aspect ratios are valuable for influencing how much we know about said world or environment mental space in a moment of time within a film or anime. This is something that I don't do quite often on the podcast and that is reference to other content but in this case this is probably the main thing which inspired me to make this podcast and I think it's very valuable and I would recommend you listen to this before pursuing this more if you want to read into it more or even now if you want you can literally pause the podcast and listen to this video or watch this video. It's a video from Insider I can't remember the name exactly but I will put it into the show notes and it has to do with Spirited Away. Way, Hayao Miyazaki and space. And as I was saying, there's one thing that probably inspired most of what I'm saying on the podcast. These aren't things which were mentioned. I don't believe aspect ratios were discussed in the video. But it's something that I just really loved and clicked with so much. And so I definitely recommend this video from Insider. And it's really based on this quote, so I'll paraphrase it anyway. And so the video states that the best parts of Spirited Away are the parts where nothing happens, or at least that's what I do believe it's said. Miyazaki intentionally tries to walk us through this world, he intentionally tries to build space, because space is very valuable. As I've said, space is information. And the video references, and these are parts which I remember from the film myself because I've watched the film about four or five times, not because I wanted to, mostly because I had someone else that was watching it and ended up watching it with them. But things like the pipe scene where you see Chihiro wobbling across the pipes to get to the other end, or the flower scene of which she's going through with Haku holding his hand or just trying to get through them. All these scenes are for the intention of building up space because... As the video concludes, we know where things are, and we know the locations of a lot of things within this world, and within a world which we're not very familiar with, if you are in the train of thought that Spirited Away is some sort of isekai anime, it's very interesting to know that you gain a much greater bearing of this place geographically almost, because of the fact that he takes the time to walk us through it. This as a result makes the world appear more convincing and the space isn't necessarily obscured by an aspect ratio as because if my research is correct, Spirited Away is shot on 1.85 to 1 which is a very small letterbox, it's not a massive one at all, it's just a tiny black bar here and there on the top and bottom. And so there isn't really this massive attempt to be restrictive, and if anything it feels as if Miyazaki's main goal is to promote expansion within this film, and I really love the emphasis of the video, which I again would really recommend watching it. There are other films which I kind of felt this to be the same with. A good example would be a film which I watched only recently, which I'm really 
really ashamed about being Markia. I don't want to go into the entire plot of Markia because there's, it's, it's quite thick to get into. But Markia, for example, is a film which it has an almost similar aesthetic philosophy to Spirited Away in regards to promoting expansion. And this is only exacerbated by its aspect ratio being done in a full 16 to 9. It, there aren't any black bars on the top or bottom from what I understand of it from when I watched it. And I thought about this similarly to how we think about Shinkai's films as well. And this is where I'll kind of touch on both of them at the same time. And 16 to 9 is so valuable because it mimics human vision. As I said, I'm not going to get into the entire deep, <laughs> thick book of lore, which is Makia. But the almost main theme of the entire film is based on experiencing life and experiencing the entire cycle of life as is. And I feel like that can only really be portrayed to its maximum extent by being able to mimic the human experience. What does it feel to be a human watching humanity unfold in front of you? And so doing it in 235 to 1 or 21 to 9 would feel very, I don't want to say pretentious because that isn't the term, or at least when I do say pretentious, I I know I did say in an earlier episode, I hate the word pretentious, but I don't mean it in the context of a criticism. I mean it in terms of it wouldn't be as genuine as it should be because of the fact that this is, as I've previously said, an anime based on the human experience. And the human experience is not one which is in 235 to 1. Life is real. Life is hard hitting as Markia tries to portray. And so I don't feel it would be as genuine if it was in that aspect ratio. This also works really well for the opening scenes of the film, such as the dragon chase scene, which I am in love with. It's a very short scene, it's like 30 seconds or so, but it's probably my favourite. And it's at the very near beginning of the film, but it really just does flex how good this ratio is. We get to see this massive dragon behind our main character, something which we wouldn't be able to get as much of in 235 to 1. And these expansive locations and environments are just made so much more, the only word I think I can think of is expansive. They feel real and although it is yes in a fantasy world to an extent, it still has this degree of realism to it and that is the importance of the aspect ratio in 16 to 9 when it comes to Makia. This is also the case with Makoto Shinkai's films. In order to emulate the real and we Shinkai does have this almost Shinkai magic to its films, I would say. If we take Kim no Nawa, which has elements of what you can call maybe the supernatural or at least phenomena, the same applies to maybe Tenki no Ko or Weathering with You, and a few others here and there. In order for the almost magical experiences to feel real or embodied with the real, again, we have to mimic the human experience. And so the human experience is portrayed in 16 to 9. I feel as if something which isn't real, you can argue hyper real, only appears as interesting or exciting as it is or as, or it feels almost like a miracle because of the fact that it is within the real world, it is within the human experience. And so putting the two together, I think is a very smart combination. And that is why I did think to myself, why is a filmmaker like Shinkai not using 235 to 1? And that makes a lot more sense now. Let's move on to 235 to 1 and the probably one of my favorite examples as to why this is an amazing aspect ratio. And I guess this kind of is me answering the question or responding to the question as to why would someone want to restrict space? If information is a positive thing, you want your audience to experience and feel more, why would you want to limit this? It does sound on paper maybe more suboptimal if you are to refer to space as information and restricting information doesn't sound like a good thing. But as I've covered in today's episode, I don't feel like that's a very productive way to analyze film and aspect ratios. And so to answer the question, I will be going into a case study. And this case study is Kizumonogatari Teketsuhen or Kizumonogatari 1. This is the first film in the three part Kizumonogatari series which I do believe came out in 2016. This, in relation to the Monogatari series, in relation to its light novels, is supposed to be the second part of the series. Taketsu is also noted to be the prologue of the Monogatari series as a whole. 
However, if you do watch in release order, which I very much do recommend, I would love to talk about that someday, but that is for another episode. If you are to watch in release order, you will be watching this a lot later in the series, and it does have, I would argue, a bit more thematic weight and these scenes from Taketsu 1, based on stuff like the aspect ratio, shot composition, etc., makes this probably one of the best parts of the series for me. Kizumonogatari Taketsu is probably one of my favourite films ever. I know there is a lot of competition and rivalry between the three Kizumonogatari films and I think they are all amazing. I think that all three of them make some of my favourite films ever, not just in anime but as a whole. But there's something about Kizumonogatari Taketsu which nails it for me. Unlike the other two films, which contain a lot more fighting in action, Takesu attempts to do something a lot bigger and I feel has probably the biggest burden on its shoulder, or at least has holds the biggest weight on its shoulder as a part of the Monogatari series, and it's an attempt to establish something a lot greater than, say, back in Monogatari or any other part of the series, and that is establish the world that Araragi Koyomi or Koyomi Araragi is living within. And thanks to the genius of none other than Tetsuya Oishi and Akiyuki Shimbo, this film managed to do that almost perfectly in my opinion. To get into the explanation, I do need to kind of talk about the almost common discourse in relation to Kizumonogatari Taketsu, and that is often that or at least I've heard that people say that most of Taketsu, at least, the first half of Taketsu is a waste of time. There is no need for it to exist. A lot of it is, and I agree, it's Koyomi walking around. It's Koyomi in his house, sitting on the chair. It's Koyomi outside, going to the library to buy some questionable magazines. It's Koyomi walking around, acting kind of fearful. And then we have the second half, which is, and I should say, spoilers for Kizumonogatari, they should be gone now. Araragi's first meeting with the legendary vampire Shinobu, um, or Kiss Shot. The reason why I disagree with this notion that the first half of Gizumon Gatari is a waste of time is that this is something one, one is very good to consider its place within the series. The introduction to Araragi as a character and this city or town which we have no idea about until this very film. Or at least, again, in, in the chronological sense. Although we do know, because we've been watching the Monogatari series hopefully for set amount of years or set amount of episodes. But if we assume that the film knows nothing about us, we are, for the first time, meeting Koyomi in this sense. And so the film attempts to build space, and as I've said, space is information. I was going to go quite in detail in regards to the first six minutes of the film and how it builds this up, but I will just give you a brief version of that. The first six minutes of the film, this analysis isn't necessarily specific to aspect ratios, but again it attempts to build up this space which we are very unfamiliar with. Despite being in 235 to 1, this could be done, and it is it is kind of done, maybe not in the same way, within the rest of the Monogatari series anyway. But we get these almost helicopter shots, metaphorical helicopter shots, because of the experimental style of Kiz Monogatari. This isn't an attempt to show a literal helicopter filming Araragi, but we have these almost codes which tag the camera shots to the sound. It's, it's a kind of, again, something which would come out of the French new wave which we get which is the main inspiration of of the Kizumonogatari trilogy anyway and it's most definitely something we'll get in the experimental style of the series and experimental film in general but we get these rotational shots going around Araraki as he walks through the cram school which these lower shots which shows all the birds flying everywhere when Araraki is burning after realizing his almost vampiric nature and so many other things. A good thing quickly to attribute is the almost documentary style of the Monogatari series as a whole. The attempt to capture everything in these characters' lives besides just the necessary. I do believe that space is under attack by not necessarily the anime community, but when we have notions like filler content, which are always thrown around in the air, it does work against other filmmaking styles which the attempt is to build up this space and it is intentional. The reason why we go to the bookstore with Araragi and the reason why we have this long street conversation with Hanakawa on the streets and just around and showing their lives is for the purpose of building up and understanding the lives and motions which these characters live. 
But probably my favorite part of this film, and I will my favorite part of the film, and where the aspect ratio truly does come in, is the train station scene. And this is what you can argue to be the climax of the scene, as well as Araragi just burning. This is the first encounter with Kishot, Aksara, Orion, Hata, and the Blade, or just Shinobu. <laughs> I'll probably say that just to keep things easy. And Araragi. This is their first meeting for the very first time. Araragi, although has a means of escape when it comes to this scene, he's walked through what seems to be a subway station of which Kishot is on the ground. All her limbs are taken off, she is red and bloodied all over the place, sprawled onto the floor. And Araragi, as I've just said, has a means of escape. There is an elevator, but where the aspect ratio comes in is that this means of escape, although is available to him in the context of the logic of the film, it is blocked off by how the shot is framed and how the aspect ratio manages to clamp over that. We get these very tight shots on Araragi during what is Yuyageshi's almost parts within the film. I, I do believe this part is Yuyageshi anyway. He animates these parts. The thing about it is that we can see the escalator, but most of his head dominates the shot, <laughs> and the aspect ratio closes in on that, and so we understand this means of an escape. However, the merging, or at least coming together of Araragi and Shinobu is seen almost as an inevitability as a result of it. That shot manages to block up and take away and retract information from our knowledge because we are fixated on the fear that Araragi is facing. This idea of limiting space within filmmaking is something which is transferred to the later shots of this very same sequence. When we get Shinobu sprawled across the floor, as I just said, but she dominates the shot. There is barely any sight of any trains from any side. It is simply just her sprawled across the floor. This reduces any distractions around Shinobu. She is the core focus, and this makes sense as she is the legendary vampire. There is no other character like her within the narrative. Even if we go as far as Awari Monogatari or any of the others, there is simply no other character that meets the scale of Shinobu or Kishot within the series, in my opinion. This is only helped by this tight framing, which allows us to only see her. I know I did say that this is mostly going to be in relation to Kizumonogatari 1, but if I do skip over to Kizumonogatari 3, this almost, again, aesthetic philosophy and use of the aspect ratio is, is used almost all the time for portraying these different emotions, and one of them is intimacy. This feeling of intimacy is in combination with Oishi's idea to keep the color palette mostly within these warm colors and make the skin tones pink in relation to blood. But the aspect ratio as a result of being in 235 to 1 closes the frame a lot more and so when we get Kishot and Araragi sitting on what seemed to be that almost, I don't remember what it was, I think it was like an oil tanker or something. When they're sitting on that and in that high place, the shot is closed down to only focus on them and they're both and they're both close together and they're almost they're also related in a sense by blood to some extent. And so I think it's just things like that which are so intentional and so thought out when it comes to the aspect ratio, which make a film like the Kizumonogatari trilogy so special. The restriction of space should be seen as just as important and valuable when it comes to analysing anime, in my opinion, and aspect ratios in anime filmmaking, as much as expanding space and creating large space. To be fair, we even get films like Children of the Sea, which attempt to almost do both with the one enclosure from the aspect ratio, as well as these massive and large and sublime moments from the environment and the water. We also even got this in Kaguya Samar recently. I'm not going to go too much into it because it's not very evergreen for anyone who's listening to this a year or so down the line. But if anything, I think that the res restriction to a degree can also equal expansion or can feel almost more expanded. Maybe that's just because it's a wide aspect ratio, but that is something that I think is probably the most mystical part of 235 to 1. I think that there are infinite possibilities with aspect ratios, and that's something to be considered when looking at film, because it's very important to note that every choice in a film, including the aspect ratio, and anime is no exception to this principle. 
So that is the analysis for this week. Let's just go to an in the moment segment. It's going to be a quick one, but I haven't done one in a while, so I really want to do this. Let's talk about my experience with Yozakura Quartet this week. It really does feel like a long time since I did this. I know I've kind of put it off in some of the other episodes, like the Vinland Saga episode last week and stuff, but I really just wanted to deliver that value because I thought that was more valuable than talking about Yozakura Quartet. However, I have thoroughly enjoyed Yozakura Quartet. To be fair, and I should talk about it, that is partially because of some of the stuff which we've been talking about today and that is one of the episodes which I really enjoyed which was Skini Naku or Yozakura Quartet Skini Naku. I don't remember what Skini Naku means in English. I know it has something to do with the moon or stars or something like that but I think that episode for me was probably what cemented why I love Yozakura Quartet as a series or why I enjoy it so much as a battle shonen. And that's because and this will encapsulate everything in the series besides maybe the 2008 original that's because it doesn't care about being goofy and fun which a lot of other shonen battle shonen specifically kind of avoid doing and i feel like comedy sometimes is also criticized as oh it's in the wrong moment but yosakura quartet doesn't really care or takes a blase approach to it by implementing it almost when it can it has this wacky feeling to it anyway we don't really question some of these almost quote power systems such as a good example would be Kotoha, for example. She has the ability to almost summon any object or item or element as long as she can physically say it, as well as saying shortcut. So if you say shortcut RPG, it will bring out an RPG literally out of nowhere. And there are many other characters with such wacky abilities, but that is the fun, I think, of Yozakura Quartet. We don't question these, or I didn't question them, I just accepted them. And upon acceptance, the these themes and fights and battles seem so invigorating and so exciting. And that links me back to Skini Naku episode 3. This has been, well, watching this episode, almost 8 minutes of it is in 2, 3, 5 to 1, which I think is insane. I do, whoever thought of that is absolutely nuts. I, I did have the name of the director for this episode because I did talk about it in a tweet a few weeks ago from when this being recorded, but I, I honestly did forget my apologies. But the episode and the, these eight minutes are so exciting. One, because of the mysticism that is 235 to 1. But also how it almost abuses it for eight minutes. And I mean abuses in a good way. Legendary animator Norio Matsumoto, for example, has this crazy scene of which these two characters fight. One of which is a werewolf. One, which is also a werewolf, I do believe. But he's kind of bad anyway, or some type of wolf. And the way Matsumoto, at least the scene of which Matsumoto animates, the way it abuses 235 to 1 is really smart because if anything, it doesn't care that it's there. We have these characters being knocked out of the frame and walking in. This is something I saw kind of in Ninja Scroll where we get our main character thrown through the wall and he'll go off frame for about five or six seconds and then he'll walk back in. It has this kind of feel of realism to it because because it, it, it's kind of this gray area between the human experience as well as the cinematic feel to it. And so I do really admire Matsumoto and this scene in general for pushing that to another level. This isn't something I was watching with the intention of discussing aspect ratios, but when I thought about this, I thought it would be really valuable to share. I do recommend Yozakura Quartet. If you are expecting a very profound battle shonen which has this exemplary power system and is to the T, you're probably looking in the wrong wrong place but if you are looking for a good time with some very exciting fights with some very good animators everyone from Shunen no Kaido to Yuki Hayashi here and there to Azushi Ikaria to Norio Matsumoto and so many more then this is the play I even forgot Shingo Yamashita as well legendary one of my favorite animators if you do want some of that then I do recommend watching Yozakura Quartet Hana no Uta Hoshino Umi as well, and Skinny Naku. Skinny Naku doesn't really get very exciting or this doesn't reach this level of production quality until episode 3, but I would recommend it nonetheless. 
So that is the indie moment segment for this week. I just wanted to talk about Yozakura Quartet has been burning inside me for a while and no one really talks about it anymore at all really. And I do think that I did find a bit of a battle shown in gem. And so I just wanted to discuss that. If you do you like Yozakura Quartet? Do you enjoy Yozakura Quartet? Tell me via email that is getinthemecha at gmail.com or you can at me on Twitter or follow me on Twitter as well for updates on the show and to tell me your opinions on Yozakura Quartet that is at getinthemecha on Twitter. So let's go to closing thoughts for this week. I'll give you my almost summary as to aspect ratios and space and the things I want you to take away from this podcast this week. So when we think about aspect ratios, it's, as I've covered many times in today's episode, it's about restricting and and expanding space. The aspect ratio, although it isn't the defining factor of a film or movie or TV series, is very important for the shots of which go into it because that will one add to or subtract from the meaning of that based on how much information or not necessarily how much because that implies quantity but what it removes or what it adds will influence how one analyzes said shot or scene or moment within the film. And as a result, that affects one's interpretation of the entirety of the film potentially. Sadly, I would say space as a concept and building space as a concept is under attack in relation to film and anime, particularly anime. When we have this concept of filler and you're wasting time within this episode or why is this episode taking so long? Why are they just walking around? These things I think damage the analysis when it comes to space and I think space is valuable for this very purpose. It's for the purpose of not just world building because that is often the easy way out of arguing for space building. I think space is probably one of the most vital factors when it comes to storytelling and sadly it's the one which is overlooked the most. How much of what is on the screen is genuinely on the screen? How much of something is limited? How are things obscured? How are things portrayed to you? How much is given to you and how much isn't are things which I think should be asked a lot more rather than why is this taking so long? When I hear things such as why are there so many irrelevant moments in the Monogatari series. Like Koyomi Monogatari, an example or a perfect example of that. Although I'll be honest, I don't think Koyomi Monogatari is the most interesting part of the series. It exists nonetheless. And it's things like that which really make me feel a bit weird about their almost take or opinion because that is an attack on space. And that's why I go with the almost analytical philosophy, if you want to call it that, of analyzing not by emission and using anime as almost this chopping board for this shouldn't be here, this shouldn't be here, this is a waste of time and more of why is this here? And aspect ratios and space are a very good way to try and think in this sort of way. And that is why I think understanding space and aspect ratios and these other elements in anime filmmaking will help you answer those questions a lot more. Thank you for listening to this episode of Guests of the Mecca. That has been episode 48. It, I know I say this every episode, but it doesn't feel like 48 at all. We're slowly getting to 50. I, I'm quite scared, to be honest. I will learn more and I will love to share what I learn and things which I don't understand even because that's also quite important as well with you guys each week. I appreciate you listening each week if you are one of those people. If you are tuning in for the first time, I appreciate you every week or this week or every anytime you come, I appreciate you basically. Thank you for clicking on this episode or searching up Get in the Mecca or whatever you did to get here to actually to actually listen to someone discuss aspect ratios for the <laughs> I I really appreciate you spending your time listening to someone talk about aspect ratios for about 40 minutes or so. So I'll see you next week on episode 49. I have been your host Jamal today and this has been Get in the Mecca. The music in this production goes as follows. 
8-bit title screen by Joth, mandatory overtime by Joth, and difference by Chasers Gaming.